In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Paul writes in Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. On one of my many walks in the Lake District, I went up to Scotland afterwards. We didn't go anywhere particularly special, but I took the dog out one day to pray, to talk, to think. And I found myself in a very strange place uh, with words that were quite peculiar to me. And I found myself, of all places, in front of a very old church. I must confess, I'm not going to tell you which one it is, because it's a church I wouldn't go to. I'm a a pastor, minister, theologian, I guess teacher, and this particular church, I guess I probably wouldn't agree with some of their doctrines and teaching or even style of worship. I wouldn't enjoy. But I found myself there with the overwhelming sense of reverence and awe for God. And the words that were going through my mind was, find the ancient path. And for all of the reasons I just mentioned that I probably wouldn't go to that church, it was abundantly clear that the Lord had genuinely, sincerely, reverently been worshipped there. And possibly still is. Jeremiah 6 says this, Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look. Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and then you will walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. They didn't, but Jeremiah still said it. Still good advice for us. Jesus, talking about roads, said this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. And if I was in a better mood, I'm being real with you, I would make a joke about what is it, the, the stairway to heaven, but the highway to hell. It gives you an indication, doesn't it, of the numbers that are going in each direction. But here I am <clears throat> outside this, I don't know, maybe I can describe it as an ancient church, I don't know, but an old church for sure, looking for ancient ways. And... Um, I'm not going to bless you with my my singing today. But I did on that day, as I'm stood there in the rain and the wind. The night was coming in. It it draws in earlier in Scotland. I was really surprised. It's like by 4 p.m. it is just dark. And we were outside with no street lights, no, uh, no houses, no light pollution. And I found myself singing, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. Take joy, my king, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. (coughs) The worst part of my confession today is I'm not sure I actually knew all the words to that song, so some of it was mumbled and hummed until I got my phone out and God bless YouTube working in the middle of nowhere. But I found myself for a really uncomfortably long period of time just singing that song repeatedly in reverence and awe of my God. Far beyond all of my circumstance, all of my grief, all of my disappointment, all of the tensions and challenges, God is still God. And God is still good. And God deserves to be revered. It was later that evening I um, prayed the Lord's Prayer. I sometimes do the way it's written. Uh, Some of us mumble through those words because there's the, I think it's in the Book of Common Prayer. That's what we learn in school. And um, that's not quite how it's written in the King James Bible. And some other translations have other uh, changes to some of the words too. That's why we, we mumbled a little bit and some of us said different words. But the heart of what we read is the same. 
And I couldn't really get past, if I'm honest, the first couple of words. We are actually going to go through, for the sake of teaching and, and context, the whole of the Lord's Prayer. But as a child, as a new believer, we often are taught and focused on the first two words. Our Father. And he is. Amen? Our Father. Our Daddy. Our Comforter. Our Shield. Our Protector. Our Provider. We are indeed his children. Adopted sons and daughters through his son Jesus. And what he did for us on the cross, that's 2 Corinthians 6, 18. There's no doubt that we are his sons and daughters. But it goes on, doesn't it? It's not there alone. It says, which are in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I've heard many uh, teachings, read many books. And especially in today's culture, in this, this country that we live, this country where we serve God, we could be rightly or wrongly accused of changing our father into our grandfather. Do you know the difference between a father and a grandfather? Grandfather gets to send them home after three hours pumped full of sugar. He's not responsible for discipline. Not responsible for protecting or providing. There's a disconnect. Actually, I only read that relatively recently. I thought it was a good analogy. Actually, the analogy I've heard before is the danger of us turning our father into dear father Christmas. Our Santa Claus in heaven. Blah, 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 blah. Give me what I want. In Jesus' name, forever and ever. Amen. But it doesn't say that. It's our father who is responsible for our well-being, our creation, our protection, our provision, and our discipline. Hebrews 12, which it was not a massive jump considering last time I was here I preached on Hebrews 11, ends with this. It says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship, which is what I'm talking about, reverence and all. For our God is a consuming fire. And over the next couple of weeks when we start talking about baby Jesus and the donkey that never was and Mary and Joseph, maybe we'll have a nativity, maybe we won't. But I don't think once we're going to use the phrase consuming fire when we tell our children about Santa Claus, Americans present. We call him Father Christmas over here. And I believe it's in that reverence and awe when Jesus himself, these were his words, taught us not only how to pray but how to live by saying our Father, to fully embrace, to fully accept the my daddy part. Daddy, I love you. Daddy, I need you. Daddy, I'm grateful for you. But I love you and I revere you and I honor you and I respect you. And here's a word that we don't like, but we fear you. And something that kept on going through my head whilst I was away is that I fear God more than I fear man. And that means that I will be persecuted for standing on the word of truth. And that is scary in the flesh. But knowing that I am a son of God, a child of the king, fills me with well, fear of him, not of the world. So what's reverence in all? Reverence for someone or something is a feeling of great respect for them. Showing a deep reverence for their religion is uh, as an example. Synonyms or words that you would think of when you think of reverence are respect, honor, worship, and admiration. All is a sense of wonder wonder and respect mixed with dread she gazed in awe at the great stones we think of wonder fear 
respect, reverence, horror, terror, dread, admiration, amazement, astonishment, veneration. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who will protect you and heal you and provide for you and forgive you. In fact, he sent himself, didn't he, and his son to die for us so that we might live, not just now, we'll get onto that in a second, but forever, with no weeping or gnashing of teeth, with no pain or suffering or injustice, but instead in a world of all and reverence and worship for the God our King in heaven. See, the reason I say the whole of the Lord's Prayer is not just a prayer, and, and it is, it is obviously a prayer in its first instance when his disciples said, Jesus teaches us how to pray, this is what Jesus said, pray like this. But in the context of the whole of the New Testament and all of Jesus' teaching, I think I've come to a personal revelation that if our life and our prayer life are separate, then something's gone wrong. Our prayer life should be our life, and our life should be our prayer life. Ricky Harvey original, I hope. I'm sure greater men than me have said that before, but I've never heard it, so I can claim it. It's mine. So if we, instead of looking at the Lord's Prayer as just something that we occasionally recite in church or pray when we don't know what else to pray, if we also take it, which many theologians do, as the model for prayer, This is all good teaching and you should absolutely do all of these things, but could I add, if I dare, a third, that we live our life by this prayer also. I think when Dave Prince was here, he's a good friend, I miss him. He's been away, he's been on several mission trips, I haven't spoken to him for a while, maybe I should. When he was here, he talked about the living sacrifice, do you remember? Do you remember the problem with the living sacrifice? Crawls off the altar. And I think we are in danger of doing that. I, forgive me, am in danger of doing that sometimes. The first three things that the Lord's Prayer tells us to do are things that God commands of us. Reverence in all, to pray for his kingdom to come, and for his will to be done. I think that's beautiful. In a world of consumerism, where our faith, along with our jobs and our families, our friendships, our relationships, our hobbies and our interests, are all designed and built around what we need and what we want, that Jesus is correcting us here and saying, this is about me. You know, your God, your Father, your Creator, your Provider, your Protector. So when you pray, pray by his name, our Father who is in heaven, in reverence and awe. Your kingdom come, your will be done. What is his kingdom? His kingdom is two things. You don't have to be a theologian to see this, but it might help in simple terms for us to understand some of the passages when we read about the kingdom. The kingdom is two things. The kingdom is both now and coming and growing. So we are part of the kingdom of, of God now. But the kingdom of God is also yet to come. It's one of those miraculous, beautiful, wonderful things of God. I call it kingdom economy because I don't really understand it. How somehow giving helps provide. How somehow forgiving heals. Where the world would tell us unforgiveness is the way forward. You know, to resent, to hold bitter, to walk away. The Lord tells us to forgive and that brings healing. That's kingdom economy and here is a a greatest example is rooted in this kingdom economy that we can pray your kingdom come and we can mean here and now lord your kingdom come here to basildon to billericay and beyond where we might see people saved and healed and restored and set free i think i need a bit of that don't you i need a bit of that right now in my life and I can also pray, Jesus, we need you now more than ever. Come, come back. When I first became a Christian, I had a youth leader who would constantly tell me, 
we could be the generation that ushered in the king. And as a young man, it, it spurred me on. It was good and it was true. It leads to the question, if Jesus returned in this very moment, would you be ready? Last time I spoke about Hebrews 11, and I talked about the things that entangle, and I talked about sin. If there were a moment where we were just entertaining that, whatever, insert your sin is, gluttony, greed, unforgiveness, resentment, uh, whatever. Unforgiveness is a beautiful one. Seeps into the church easily. And Jesus came in that moment. How would we feel? We'd be gutted, wouldn't we? We'd be broken inside. Lord, I'm so sorry, but like seven days a week, 23 hours a day, I am a good Christian boy, but I just love to dwell in my brokenness every now and again. And, and especially when I see that person or when it comes to my... Uh, pornography addiction. I don't have a pornography addiction, but some do. And imagine if that's the moment you've just got your phone out and you just go to that website and that's the moment Jesus comes. Wouldn't we feel things that we shouldn't feel because we've entertained things we shouldn't entertain? So we can pray for his kingdom to come now in this present age and for the new heaven and the new earth. And I think we went through it well in James 4, 4, where it said a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So sin can be anything. That is what separates us from God. What's his will? Thy will be done. Well, this one's a little easier. I think where it, Matthew 22, 37 to 40 says, again, Jesus' words, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not sure um, too many of us can say that is something we've cracked completely. Maybe we do it a lot of the time. I do it some of the time. I try to love the Lord with all my heart. You know, these, I think of these passages, you know, when the rich young ruler and he went up to Jesus and said, what do I need to do to follow you? And Jesus just knew what was bigger in that rich young ruler's heart than him, and it was money. He said, well, go and sell all your stuff and come follow me. And the rich young ruler went, no, I can't, because it was bigger than me. What about the one where he said, and this, is, this has been real to me, between friends and family, three people have died within a month. And maybe Jesus is saying to me, hey, Rick, come follow me. And I'm saying, can I just go and bury them first? Lord, can I have a day off to grieve? And he said, no, come follow me. Let the dead bury the dead. It's hard, isn't it, when it becomes real, when it becomes personal. But that's what his will is, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The next three things, if the first three things are the things that God requires of us, the next three things are the things we require of him, aren't they? Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. <clears throat> forgive me, I, I, I don't want to take passages out of context. That's why I'm going to go through the whole of the Lord's Prayer but really I want to stay focused and I'll, I'll loop back round to, to reverence and awe at every given opportunity. So give us this day our daily bread. Sometimes can be interpreted as spiritual food. So that can be your prayer life, receiving the Holy Spirit. It can be your uh, reading of Scripture. It can be your family, your church, your accountability, etc. And, uh, and people will then, if they accept that, they'll write off their physical provision. Other people will interpret this very literally. Lord, you are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. And I know I have been definitely guilty of this in the past, where I have been so concerned about the stability of where my salary will come from, that I've worked harder, not necessarily in the church. You guys have always been very faithful to me and in my support, and I'm very grateful for that. But when I was in business or uh, when Alicia and I dated, it was, um, it's a story I tell quite uh, flippantly, but at 17 years of age, I was in a one-bedroom bedsit. For those of you who don't know what a bedsit is, a bedsit is like a, a double bedroom that you would have in your house 
but it has a bed, a wardrobe, a sink, and that's it. And you can add things, so I had like a little microwave eventually, and I had a toaster and a kettle. And that was it. And one day I'd just finished my 12-hour night shift in a rubber molding plant, and I was hungry. And all I had was a tin of baked beans that I'd eaten some days before, put a bit of silver foil over the top that you do to reserve, preserve it, and on the top a little bit of green mold had grown. So I had no choice but to scrape off the green mold most people would joke, if I was saying this as a university student, you'd all be laughing, right? But you're giving me a bit more sympathy because I'm working in a factory. But the truth is, that's all I had. The truth is that most of my adult life, I have been blessed to such an abundant level as to be quite really unrealistic. Cars provided to me, first of all, get this, from a company, from, from 19 to my mid-20s, they were just like, hey, here's some keys, go and drive that car for a bit. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. To even giving up my company car to somebody in this very church, buying me a car, because I didn't have one. Jehovah Jireh is my provider. I'm grateful for that person's obedience in their generosity. Two of you, two of you have hosted me in your homes for prolonged periods of time so that I didn't have to do the kind of two and a half hour commutes from the Midlands. People amongst you have been genuinely kind to me for, for prolonged periods of time, even without any kind of generosity, just kindness. So when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we can mean both things. Lord, provide for us a stable job, an income, enough money for my bills, maybe even a blessing, enough money for a holiday. Wouldn't that be nice? I'd highly recommend the Lake District. It's a beautiful place, even when it is raining and cold and dark and dingy. Maybe you actually might find an ancient path there, like I did. You don't have to go to the Lake District to find that. You can find that here and now and, and in your own house. But you can also pray for your spiritual food. Man cannot live on bread alone, Matthew 4.4. 4. Jesus said the same himself when he was being tempted. This next part is critical. If you, it just blew my mind when I read this. One. Uh, uh, it's a longer sermon than normal, forgive me, because I've had two weeks to think about it. I don't normally get that much time. But every part of this are the things that we require in our Christian walk and in our Christian life. Forgive us. How many of us often genuinely sit, stop, kneel, stand, close our eyes, take a moment and list, Lord, I know, I know that I sinned today. I know that I didn't forgive that person who hurt my friend. I know that I didn't forgive that person who hurt me. Lord, I know that I looked at that picture on Instagram that was just not helpful. Looking at a beautiful woman for me is not a sin. But it wasn't helpful. All things can be lawful to us, but not all things helpful is something to remember when we're trying to avoid things like temptation or sin. The truth is, I think maybe some of us are better at asking for that kind of forgiveness. Lord, forgive us our debts. And I hate it. I hate it how the Lord has intertwined these two as we forgive our debtors. Different translations for those who've sinned against us, trespasses, debts or debtors. It can mean two things. It can mean those that have done stuff to hurt us or those that have not done stuff. Did you, have you ever seen that? The, the sin of omission. I was so blessed when Robin came to pray for me during worship. And even moments ago, you saw me go outside, those that came to pray with me then. I'm not saying that those of you who didn't were in the sin of omission, but you understand what I'm saying. How many of us have seen something good to do and not done it? Well, Lord, forgive us for those things too. We can all name the times where somebody should have done something to us. You should have shown me more grace. You should have forgiven me faster. You should have helped me. Well, Lord, we need to forgive them too. 
Lord, that person hurt me. That person hurt Alicia. I'm going to forgive you. And forgiveness is something that's really hard in the flesh. But when done in the spirit, when done in prayer, the Lord gives you the strength to to do that. Would you believe that? Even the worst kind of sin against you is possible to forgive when you're doing it in prayer. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's a bit of a contrast, isn't it? We know that the Lord doesn't tempt us, so why on earth would he put this in the prayer? Well, Jesus was led into temptation, wasn't he, by the Holy Spirit? God never tempted him, but the Holy Spirit led him to a place where he could be tempted. Well, my prayer, certainly when I feel like this, when I'm at my, my least, where I need the most of Jesus, is, Lord, lead me away from temptation. Lord, take me away from the things that have held me back. This is going to kill you, I'm sorry. Even the other day, I was driving behind, it was yesterday, I was at the football, and I was driving behind uh, very slowly in traffic, and the car in front, the driver was having a cigarette. But, of course, because we were driving slowly, the, the smoke was wafting back towards my car. And for those of you who don't know, I was a big smoker for many years, from the age of 11 to the age of 25 or something like that. And at 25, I was on 40 a day. I was hooked. And it's what I would do when I was stressed. Is it sinful to smoke? No. No, no, not a single place in the Bible does it say it's a sin to smoke. We can get some crude references to your body as a temple or how you spend your money and being a good steward of money and and all those different things, but it's not a specifically mentioned sin in the Bible to smoke. So is it lawful? Yes. Is it helpful? No. And I've got to confess, for the first time in more years than I care to remember, I had to pray, Lord, lead me away from temptation. There was like a familiarity about the smell. The smell. Didn't even know them, didn't have access to them. Wouldn't have even wanted one if we'd both got out of the car and started to have a chat and he said, hey, do you want a cig? I would have said no. But in that moment, just a split second, Lord, lead me away from temptation and it's connected. Deliver me from evil. Some translations even say the evil one. Because the Lord won't tempt you or hurt you. But like in Job, he sometimes allows it. He allows it so that you lean on him. He allows it so that you might grow. But the truth is, I don't think any one of us would invite that. There's um, a lot of teaching around, Lord, give me perseverance. And the Lord answers the question by sending you trials and challenges. Helps you grow perseverance. So you might ask for it indirectly. But actually, I don't think any one of you would say, Lord, I've really had a good couple of years. I really feel ready now for a few years of tribulation. So if you could send some, you know, like, uh, like, and really spread it out, could you? Like, give me a really bad, unsolvable business problem, right? And then, and then break a dear friendship. That'd be really cool, right? The people I would go to for help. Break, damage that friendship for me because then I'll come to you instead. And actually, do you know what? Give me some health issues so that I'm not even doing these things from a place of rest, but from pain and sleeplessness. And then, Lord, do you know what? Attack my mental health too. And, and, and. Any one of you prayed a prayer like that? And I wouldn't suggest you do. I'd pray a prayer like this instead. Lord, lead me away from temptation and deliver me from evil. It's interesting, some, uh, some Bibles don't even have this part. Mine didn't. I have an NIV study Bible. It's the one I read for years. I was always very confused for the, where did the, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen, come. And the truth is that the reason it's in some and not others is because it, that's what, the way it was in the beginning. The original manuscripts, some did have it, <coughs> and some didn't. It doesn't happen very often in the Bible. Mostly the manuscripts completely align. But I read predominantly three different types of Bibles. I tend to read the NIV. It's not in there. I tend to read the ESV. That's the one we normally put up on the board. Uh, It's not in there. 
and I read the King James Bible, or the New King James Bible, if I'm really honest, because I struggle with some of the older English, because I'm a young man, even though I turned 40 last time I was here. Still a young man. But it is in there. So should we pray it or not? I don't know. Should we weigh it first? Is his the kingdom, the power, and the glory? Yes. Amen? Yes? Well, let's pray it then. Honestly, sometimes it just has to be that simple. Is it good? Is it godly? Is it in line with the rest of Scripture? Then let's pray it anyway. I honestly can't remember the last time I chose a passage from the New King James or the King James to preach on on a Sunday. But I did deliberately because I wanted it in there because I knew you'd say it when I asked you to recite it because that's the one you learn when you're in school. Let no one ever leave church ever wondering, so what? That's what I was taught when I was learning how to preach. So what? I don't care how often you pray this prayer. I don't. Literally, the way you recite it, maybe you're one of those people that wakes up every morning, you've got really good self-discipline, you're like, right, even before I go to pee and brush my teeth, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Amen? Amen. Okay? Every day, maybe three times a day. Maybe you're like me. Maybe, you, maybe you're one of those people who actually have a pretty good prayer life, but, but pray this when you're stuck. Like, Lord, you, you just, you know, I can't even vocalize this, but you know, so let me pray this. Father, you are in heaven, and you are God, and I love you, and I trust you, and I need you. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I remember praying for, forgive me, another grief situation, another bereavement, but praying for a man who was sick in hospital. And as I prayed, I got an overwhelming sense from the Holy Spirit that that man had already actually left and was in heaven. He'd already been claimed by God, like his time has come, he's with me. But the heartbeat was still going and the pulse was still there and he was still on the machine and the doctors gathered round and the nurses gathered round and they came with me to pray and I'm like, Lord, heal him. I have faith to raise the dead for other people. Sometimes I don't even have faith to get out of bed myself, but I have faith to raise the dead. So here I am praying, Lord, bring him back to him, bring him back to his family, bring him back so that he might be a testimony for you. And the Lord says, well, I can't because he's already with me. So the prayer comes out slightly differently. Lord, your will be done. If it's your will to bring him back, bring him back. If it's not your will, then don't. In many of my situations of grief, specifically, disappointment, frustration, I have found myself praying that more and more, your, your, your will, Lord, your will be done. Not because it, it feels defeatist that I'm not going to get my own way, but perhaps just perhaps my way isn't the best way. Perhaps I shouldn't be molding God in my image. Perhaps I should be molded into his. So I say perhaps, of course I should be. You know it's rhetorical. So, the, so what? <clears throat> I'd like you each, not now, but when you leave, maybe this afternoon, maybe throughout the week, to pray this prayer, both in the literal and in the structure. But instead of just reciting it through or, or using it as your structure, so whichever one of those you do, to help us make it become part of our life, to link our prayer life with our, our living life, our work life, our family life, I want you to do this. Father, hallowed be your name and then stop. Take a moment to show some reverence and awe to him and who he is and what he's done. Maybe you might add your own reverence to it. Lord, I am just simply overwhelmed by your greatness, by your goodness, that you created me, that you loved me. Lord, I submit my life back to you again. Lord, I get back on the altar the funny one that Dave said, right? Stop crawling off the altar. Get back on the altar. Lord, you are, you are God. I want you to stop and pray specifically for the things of his kingdom to come in this town. He was uncomfortably long, wasn't it? The notices. Like there's a lot of stuff happening in the church in the next couple of weeks. And even more outside of the church. 
And as always, there's stuff going on in your own families, your own lives. Stop and pray for those things specifically. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now your kingdom come. Your kingdom come to Ukraine now, Jesus. We need you. Your kingdom come to Gaza and Israel now, Jesus. We need you. Your kingdom come to festive Fred. We need you. Your kingdom come to those who are at home sick. Your kingdom come to those who are suffering with their mental health. Lord, your kingdom come to those who are grieving. Lord, your will be done. Lord, reveal to me what your will is. We know it's to love you with all my heart and mind and soul and body and life and money and job and family. But Lord, that just seems too much. So show me the parts of my life that I haven't given to you yet and then give me the strength and conviction to do so. Lord, I know I'm supposed to love everyone else as I love myself and I find that really hard. I do because I'm selfish, because I'm human. Lord, give me that compassion for others. You understand where I'm going with this? Praying word by word, asking for the things that you need. Maybe you do have money trouble. Maybe there are some of you in credit card debt. Maybe some of you are really struggling to make the bills. We just turned into that cold season again. And I, I remember getting, I got my British gas statement. I've been carried on paying the high amount throughout the summer. So it's like, oh, you are like this much ahead. And like for a split second, I'm like, <clears throat> I'm going to claim a refund and go on holiday. That's awesome. A couple of hundred pounds. Like it's a significant sum. And then that sinking feeling that I'm sure we all had, unless we happen to be super rich, of, uh, I'm ahead for a reason. Because the heating's just gone on now. And that's going to be expensive. Some of you may be struggling with that. Some of you may not even have a job. Some of you may not be able to work. Some of you may need an answer to prayer on health or relationship or family. How about forgive us our trespasses? How often do we try and capture all that? Lord, forgive me. I sinned. Lord, forgive me when I got angry at that man in the car yesterday because he cut me up. Genuine story. It happened on the way to football. Lord, forgive me for that moment during the football match when I just became so overwhelmed with anxiety and grief that I actually forgot for a moment to put my trust in you and that you were my God. Lord, forgive me, everyone. You get the, the example? Lord, give me a list of those that I need to forgive for their trespasses against me. Maybe there we can even find a specific area where we are being tempted or exposed to the evil one or to evil and pray through that too. So it's not home group homework this week. It's personal. It's an individual assignment to get right with God through prayer, to have your life and your prayer life realigned to him and to his word. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we start now. You are God, and we trust you, and we love you, and we are grateful for you, and we are in awe of you. Help us this week to have adopted this into our hearts and our minds and our spirit and our work life and our walk with you. Lord, give us the conviction Give us the strength to deal with it. And Lord, where we need your help, where we need your healing, oh Lord, come. I need you. In Jesus' name, amen.